the Ultra Blue Island in May 2024. It's a trail race in the Azores on the island of Faial, which is about a thousand miles off the coast of Portugal in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. The Whaler's Great Route is 118 kilometers and has 4,600 meters of climbing and starts on a tiny little outcrop of rock on the north side of the island. Due to the fact that the island is only 21 kilometers end to end, the route takes an intricate route around and then through the island, going over three large climbs through muddy and rocky volcanoes. On the day of the race, due to a delayed inbound flight, I'd arrived on the island at the very last minute. And I mean literally, I walked into the race briefing just as it was starting. Then I dashed upstairs to check into the race, got a lift back to the hotel to check in there, threw a load of random items into drop bags, got some of my gear on, forgot the rest, and ran down to catch the shuttle bus, which took us to the start line. As you can probably imagine, this isn't the ideal start to a race. I was completely disorganised, and frankly shocked to have even made it to the start line at all. The race started at 10pm, so it began with several hours of darkness. In the UK, most ultras start early in the morning, so I wasn't quite sure how my body would react to the strange start time. I really can't express just how excited I felt at this point. Despite the oddly surreal music, my total disorganisation and the guy blowing a vuvuzela into my ear, I just couldn't wait to get started, see what was on the island and find out what it feels like to run an island race like this. I've never run a race in a place as hilly as this, so it was a big unknown for me. Talking of statistics, the race has a time limit of 28 hours, but one of the reasons I decided to travel to do it because it's a Western States qualifier and for that, I needed to finish it in 26 hours. The winner finished in under 16 hours last year, and I was secretly hoping for an 18 or 19 hour finish. But really, I had no idea how long this thing would take me, or even if I'd finished at all. Additionally, at the race briefing, I'd learned that the race was to be cut short by about eight kilometers due to some really bad weather that was forecast. I hadn't quite worked out what that meant for cutoff times or qualification times as I was too busy rushing around. Besides, I didn't really know anything about the course or the route anyway, so I just did my best to keep moving forward. These were my very first steps ever running on a volcanic island, and I quickly learnt what that means in terms of hills. Even on supposedly flat sections like these, the trail either goes straight up or straight down. You simply don't get flat bits on volcanoes. I think I might have underestimated this. <laughs> I'd spent the previous five months training on the most hilly and muddy terrain I could find in Hampstead Heath in London, so I felt fairly confident about navigating puddles, a fact which was quickly disproved within about five minutes of the race starting when I fell over in a stream and nearly took out the poor lady in front of me. Wait. Oh, it's a scooper, the scooper. Oh, uh, the scooper. Is that me? Oh, I'm fine, thank you. Both my shoes ended up soaking wet, and they would end up staying that way for many hours. I was happy that there were supporters on the course, and that they'd exchanged their angry vuvuzelas for some slightly more motivational cowbell. Anyway, despite the high winds, the weather was quite warm and humid, so it was easy to avoid getting cold. However, that would soon change, and it would have lasting consequences for me. Electric fence. It's very tricky underfoot here. Oh, it's not an electric fence. A bunch of us just went off the course by only a few meters before we realized we'd gone wrong. Trying to see these markers, even though they've got reflective tape on them, can be tricky. Especially when they're in sort of knee-high grass. The ground underfoot is very, very 
uneven. It looks fairly soft and, and nice around, but it's, it's all lumpy underneath. And uh, yeah, I mean, I can see a few twisted ankles here. If you're not careful. Yeah, yeah no bits like this. Dead technical. Well, for me, it is anyway. Five kilometers in. Bloody cows everywhere. Look at them all. So yeah, just gonna put my head down and try and do these nighttime kilometers as well as I can. We're about to go straight up a volcano in a, in a few minutes, I think. So I'm enjoying this runnable section. So after the first five kilometers of running, the course turns and goes uphill for five kilometers, goes around a few little loops and then comes back down to the coast. Visibility is quite low. Wind's really picked up. I can't really see anyone around me at all. It's about 10 kilometers in and uh, it started to rain. And uh, yeah, just doing my best to keep an eye on these fluorescent flags because if I lose them, I'll be really stuck. Some proper tropical trails. Wow, look at this. Jeez. So exciting, oh my God. Never run anything like this before. I, mean, I can't see anything around me, but it's just so cool just being here. When I rinse down, oh, I feel great. I feel so good. So only 12 kilometers done in nearly two hours. But I mean, if I keep this pace up for the whole race, I'd probably finish top 20. So I better cool it down a little bit. But I think the next two hills will probably sort that out for me. Holy shit, look at this. Wow. This tunnel is made of earth. I mean, this would probably be breathtakingly beautiful if I could see anything. Just trying to make sure I don't disappear into a gorge. All right, so I think we've just skirted around the top of the volcano. I can't really tell because I can't see anything. I can see that we're coming down now, so this must be the first downhill. I, mean, I don't know what you can see on the camera, but it can't be much worse than what I can see. What you can see on the camera was literally all I could see on the trail. The visibility was that bad. I was using peripheral vision just to try to make out the trail in front of me, and despite a few falls, it was just luck that I didn't fall and seriously hurt myself or fall off a cliff. My, my feet are so wet so many times through that, uh, I mean, I'm basically swimming in my shoes. Uh, so I've picked up a little group of people out here and it's, yeah, it's a bit better running in a group. Got about seven sets of eyes looking for these bloody little flags. The aid stations at this race were wonderful and very unique. Most were in these little stone huts and I think they were staffed by local volunteers. Most people spoke only Portuguese and everyone was very friendly. Here I thought she was asking if I wanted her to throw away my bottle, but she was just asking if she should throw away the water inside. Depois está aqui para te filmar, só para te filmar. Ah? Ah, obrigado. The local government funds this race as a way to help promote the island as an adventure destination. Only 65 people started the 118k race, 
so it's a really small event but so many people came out in the middle of the night to offer help and support. I was trying to be really efficient at checkpoints by getting my bottles filled quickly, grabbing a few handfuls of food and then leaving before I started to get cold. The next section along the coast doesn't really look like much on the map and it doesn't climb any mountains but it was physically very draining because it was a series of about 200 tiny climbs and descents through dense bamboo plants and other tropical trees. The ground was a mixture of slick mud, jagged volcanic rock and tree roots. So many tree roots. It's mentally tiring. I mean it's physically tiring too but it's also mentally tiring. <laughs> And it's 2am. All over a couple of times. Thankfully it was on softer, <laughs> softer rocks with some soil sort of sprinkled in. At the end of that section, at about 30 kilometres in, we ran towards the Capelinos National Park. This is one of the most beautiful and unique parts of the island. It's a new addition to the island thanks to a series of volcanoes that erupted in the ocean in 1957 creating this new moon-like landscape. However, we couldn't see any of it during this race because it was foggy and it was dark and it was 2.30 in the morning. However, we did see this lovely windswept checkpoint and it contained humans bearing orange juice and a small wooden boat. I mentioned just here that I'd been having shoe troubles and it had been driving me absolutely mad for about two hours. Every time I went downhill, the soles in my waterlogged shoes were sliding forwards in each shoe, curling up over the top of the foot and looping back towards the opening. It's like they were trying to escape. So I'll keep sliding forwards when I go downhill. And I've got a lot of fucking downhill left. Approximately 3,000 meters of descent. Every time I go down, they bunch forwards and I have to use my toes to pull them back. The following three hours were absolutely dreadful. The rain was torrential, electric storms kept rolling in, the winds were about 60 kilometers an hour, and it was about 15 kilometers of uphill with only 10 meters of visibility in front of my face due to heavy fog. It's quite heavy, heavy downpour at the moment. A little bit chilly. Every time I slowed down a bit, I started to get cold and shivery. I simply wasn't wearing enough. I was in shorts, t-shirt and a waterproof jacket. Too little for an exposed climb up a volcano in the conditions. I had to keep squeezing out my waterproof gloves and keep my hands tucked up my shirt to stop them from going numb. I seemed unable to eat enough calories to keep myself warm, yet the climb was too steep to speed up. I tried to increase the number of calories I was eating, but I started to feel sick, which slowed me down and made me cold again. This catch-22 was compounded by the fact that I couldn't hear myself think due to the wind. I started to despair. I really didn't enjoy this section. Bad luck, mate. Oof. 42 kilometers. First marathon done. Only two more to go, I think. Let's not think about that, actually. Um, seven hours down, and uh, I am really focusing on the sunrise that is about to start any moment. Might be a while before we see it with, with this fog, but I've had the sleep gremlins, I've had the dropout gremlins, I've had the I'm tired and I'm on holiday, I should be relaxing gremlins. Lots of uh, different voices coming up with very, very good reasons to uh, stop. Uh, the best reason not to stop, to be frank, is I would get hypothermia and probably die of exposure in about 20 minutes. 
so that's a good reason to carry on and I do want to see the sunrise I do want to finish this race I want to see what this what this place <laughs> looks like in the daylight hello I have just come out of the last checkpoint and completely uh, reinvented myself my two coats uh, leggings over my shorts uh, dry gloves and uh, some uh, mystery cake I'm trying to stay warm and sort of reset a little bit I think my stomach started to sour a little bit and I'm not eating properly um, I'm just having uh, at the bare minimum to keep me going yeah I've topped up my waters and uh, yeah I'm gonna walk and have some breakfast I think if I don't reset now and look after myself I think today's gonna go very poorly and uh, it may impact my ability to finish so I'm just doing some housekeeping uh, I'm just trying to yeah switch back to enjoying the terrain and it is beautiful the sun's I can't really see it but it's sun is coming up over there big golden sky uh, yeah it's a pretty nice place it's, it's so nice to see what's around I mean oh gosh that weather on top oh it was bad anyway eight kilometers until I get my, my first kit bag and I'm gonna grab a few bits from that as well some dry gloves um, some other you know, I don't know, sunglasses and all that and yeah I'm just gonna reset again and uh, get ready for the day ahead about 52 km which means nearly halfway uh, if I lie to myself I can say it's halfway I knew from experience here that if I kept pushing I'd just run myself into the ground and end up feeling sick if I wanted to continue, I had to be smart for a change and slow down before I was forced to eat and warm up. And it felt great. And the view wasn't bad either. With the sun on my face and the wind to my back, going downhill towards the coast felt superb. The 60 km checkpoint was at the bottom, in the town of Orta. I was going to have another strategic pit stop and get myself properly dressed and ready for what lay ahead. Look at this. Oh my word. That is incredible. Well done, you made it to the 60. We arrived at the same time. How are you feeling? Good. I have your shoes. Thanks. I'm going to change everything. Even my legs. <laughs> Os dois, inglês e português. Ok. I found out here that I was supposed to have been given a GPS tracker at race check-in, but they'd forgotten to give it to me. So I'd done the first half of the race as a sort of ghost runner, showing up at checkpoints, but disappearing from the map in the sections between. It caused a little bit of concern among family members who were trying to find me on the map. They theorised that maybe I was doing a different race, or maybe I'd dropped out, or maybe I'd fallen off a cliff. I spent about 20 minutes at the checkpoint, during which I very thankfully changed my shoes, and then my very kind wife kicked me out and told me to get on with it. I took my waiting cake and pressed on towards the next 400 meter climb. At the, at the marina at the moment, nice in the sunshine. I think I'm going over there. All right, we're leaving the town of Orta and going all the way up to the top and then start to attack the final really big climb up to the top of the volcano, somewhere over there near those clouds. And I just hope it isn't like it was last night. Oh, it was so bad. I just, yeah, I don't know, I've got a, 
11 hours on the clock for 65k I think I hope that leaves me enough time to do the final uh, oh god maths is so hard when you're running this climb quickly turned into a muddy path then into a stony track then into a dried up riverbed then an actual riverbed with rocks and boulders it was immense fun but extremely challenging and very slow this is the trickiest I mean is this the most difficult way to go downhill through shin high sticky clay oh. Oh. hello so I'm about 72 kilometers in out of 110 and my strategy has changed again since last night's awful conditions and uh, yeah I just had to adapt to survive really I'm hiking the hills the uphills uh, fairly quickly and run, trying to run the downhills and the flats where possible you know unless it's ridiculous and Yeah, but just with a view to really, just to try and enjoy the race. So this is the first time I've seen across to Pico Island. We're on the correct side now, and it's daylight. So you can't actually see the top, but if you look carefully, you can see that kind of weird dome shaped cloud above the, above the volcano. I think, I don't know, this is the last climb anymore. I've, I'll probably stop just guessing. I have to believe it's the last one, but it's probably better for my mental health if I tell myself it's the second last one. Ah, oh, the joy of mobile phones. It is the last time. Unfortunately, it lasts for about 19 kilometers. Before we get to the top, I think there's another aid station. And I'm gonna smash 10 pints of Coke. This race has managed to destroy me gradually. And from very early on, not to the point where I had to drop out, it draws it out of you slowly. It's like being on the North Downs Way here. This is steeper, way steeper than Box Hill step is so <laughs> so short and goes up so high well this is called Ponta da Hiberinha I think it's an old lighthouse that was destroyed in an earthquake many years ago this section is impossible oh my god I don't know what you're supposed to do come on guys add some stairs Oh, you know you like a good stair. Oh my lord. This is the hardest section so far. It's going to take me an hour to get up to that flipping flag up there. Man alive. Holy Christ. Oh. Oh. Oh my lord. Oh. Well, I'm at 85 or 86k. Well into this final climb. But still, I mean, I think I've still got a few hours on it left. I mean, I just have to take this at such a snail's pace. Meanwhile, behind me, there's some fella on hiking poles who's absolutely powering up. So I'm finally above that 
horrible steep slippery section ah oh, that has to be the most difficult part of today sort of physically difficult at least the uh, early morning hours were mentally challenging in a different very different and horrible way so a little bit of road section check out my new waterproof gloves oh. Hey mate, how you doing? Yeah. You all good, yeah? Yeah, okay. yeah not too bad. Ah, oh, slowly mate. It's been a long one, hasn't it? The kilometre 93 checkpoint was staffed by wonderful scout volunteers. I also met this friendly Brit who was doing the whole race with hiking poles made of bamboo sticks that he'd picked up on the trail. I took a massive bag full of cake and steeled myself for the final enormous climb up to the rim of the volcano. Here we go. This is the sign I've been looking for. Caldera. This was where all those hours of training on the treadmill with 20% incline paid off. I was able to power hike for about an hour up this long road with about 20 switchbacks near the top until we reached the turn off to the rim. Well, here we are, at the very top. Oh my God, wow. Oh, I wasn't ready for that. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, whoa. Oh my God, the colors. Oh, well, we're not at the very top, are we? There's more top over there. Oh my word, well. Get to it. Long way down. So this is a famous little hut. I think it's a pilgrimage site. Part of the pilgrimage network on the island, I think. Too bad with heights, but that's pretty terrifying to me. So this is the top of the next tool bit. I am obviously assuming there are several more increasingly taller bits behind it. Well, it's quite interesting. There's this low bit just here, which is what's letting in all the cloud, and it kind of goes down into the crater. And sort of flies off over there. Can't see what's behind the cloud. Probably Mount Everest. It's just, just, be, just beyond that hill. Well, this is the, uh, the windy bit where the clouds come in. Oh, just crash! Heavy clouds. Okay, this is some of the most technical downhill I've had. Find a way to do it without breaking my legs. That would be beneficial. Well, over an hour later, I'm still on the rim of the volcano, but would you believe it? There is a sign. It's telling me don't continue on the rim. Ah! Oh, finally, a perk of running 118k. <laughs> to go down. Oh, thank God. Let's go. Let's go down. Let's go to the finish line. So this final descent looks, yeah, not as bad as it could have been. 
seems to just be dirt roads. This is probably the quickest way to descend. Quads are a bit, uh, a little bit iffy, but can't complain too much given what we've had for the rest of the day. I remember this sort of trail from last night. I don't know if it's the same section. It's probably a completely different side of the island, but it's amazing. It's so unique with these rooty bits, muddy bits. And then you have these little stones here. Very cool. I mean, I could run it last night. Now I'm just power hiking, but less power. To be honest, less hiking. It's just kind of strolling around at this stage. Wow! Wow! Look at that beautiful waterfall. Don't look down. He says, looking down. Well, bit of a problem. Got stuck in the mud. See if I can get my shoe out. Ah! Oh, look at that. Mud pie supreme. I'm unstoppable now. Oh. Oh. Well, washing mud with mud. Bloody hell, this bit just goes on and on. As I finished the, f the last climb, what is definitely the last climb, because that's the sound of the sea down there, which means three kilometers to go. Before I come into the finish, this wasn't the hardest race physically or mentally, but it did teach me something valuable it's something I've known but never actually done that it's okay to change the goal for the race uh, I started off wanting to really push hard the whole race and I misjudged the weather uh, you know it went south there for me but you know I said that I still wanted to do it but I just changed the goalposts and just uh, didn't worry. So just kind of, I think that's just experience, really. Um, and I'm not a particularly experienced ultra runner like, like some people are, you know, with 30 or 40 years of experience of, uh, you know, insane ultras. And I do have well, one a year and I've done it for about 10 years. And uh, it feels nice to kind of, yeah, to have learned something and be able to save my day and have some perspective and know that later I'd probably feel okay. And yeah, I'm really pleased about that. It's been tough, for sure. The final descent was as slow as anything I'd done all day, but despite how tired I was, I was still able to run the final kilometers to the finish. Oh. I was happy to finish, but sadly it was over, which was testament to how good I felt. Due to my really good training, not to mention a sense of a readjustment of my strategy, I was able to enjoy this race and really appreciate being in the wilderness in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. My time of 21 and a half hours wasn't what I'd hoped for, but I hadn't really come here to run fast. I'd come to explore a place unlike any I'd ever seen. This is a superb race and I'd strongly recommend it. The people of the Azores are wonderful and the race organisation is world class. Thanks very much for watching. 
I hope your training and racing is going well and I hope to bump into you out there on the trails.